Welcome to Pediatric Podcast for PedsCases.com. Welcome to Approach to Prematurity, Part 1, An Overview of Prematurity, created for PedsCases.com. My name is Jana hansri and I'm a medical student at the Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine at McMaster University. This is a two-part video that aims to provide the learner an overview of prematurity, considerations surrounding stabilization of preterm infants, and finally, a systems-based approach to common conditions associated with prematurity. This podcast would not be possible without the kindness and support of Dr. Kristen Inch, a pediatrician practicing at the Special Care Nursery at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario. By the end of part one, we hope that the learner will be able to define prematurity and review its epidemiology in Canada, describe major risk factors for preterm birth, and compare the different characteristics of extremely preterm, very preterm, and infants born at term. In part two, we will outline the considerations for initial stabilization of a premature infant and describe a systems-based approach to recognizing and managing common short-term complications associated with prematurity. Let's begin with our first objective. Historically, prematurity was defined as a birth weight lower than 2,500 grams. However, it is now defined by the World Health Organization as babies born alive before 37 weeks gestation from the last menstrual period, or LMP. The LMP refers to the first day of an expected mother's last menses. It can be used to calculate the estimated due date using Nagel's rule, which is the LMP plus seven days minus three months. It is important to note, however, that according to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, determining gestational age should be based on the best obstetric estimate rather than the LMP alone. This primarily involves the first trimester ultrasound. Preterm birth is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in children younger than five years around the world. In Canada, preterm birth occurs in about 8% of total pregnancies. Preterm birth accounts for nearly two thirds of infant deaths in Canada as well as increased morbidity later in the life course, as demonstrated by increased rates of adult onset chronic disease. There are slightly more male preterm births than female preterm births, with 8.3% of male births being preterm compared to 7.3% of female births. Preterm birth is much more common in multiple pregnancies compared to single births. Additionally, preterm births are most prevalent among mothers aged 35 to 49 years of age. And now to introduce our cases. While on your pediatrics rotation, you are called down to evaluate three expecting mothers who have presented to LMD. Our first mother is Mrs. Amy Austin. Amy is 24 years old and is 38 weeks pregnant. She is expecting her first child, whom her second trimester ultrasound presumes to be male. Amy is not currently on any medications, but has a history of recurrent UTIs that have generally resolved on their own. Before she was pregnant, Amy would sometimes enjoy a drink or two with dinner three times a week and has a three-pack year history of smoking, although she has significantly cut down on smoking since finding out she was pregnant and does not drink anymore at all. Our second mother is Mrs. Brianka Balakrishnan. Brianka is 38 years old and is 28 weeks pregnant. She is expecting her second child, whom the ultrasound presumes to be female. Brianka had her first child when she was 29, who was born prematurely at 32 weeks gestational age. Brianka has a history of hypertension for which she is being treated with labetalol. Brianka does not smoke or drink and never has. Finally, we have Miss Catherine Chang. Catherine is 27 years old and is 35 weeks pregnant. She is expecting twins, one male and one female. This is Catherine's first pregnancy. In the past, Catherine has been told by her gynecologist that she has something called a bicornet uterus. Catherine is otherwise healthy and does not drink or smoke. Let's look at some of the possible risk factors for preterm birth amongst these three expecting mothers. Spontaneous preterm birth is multifactorial, meaning it can be caused by all sorts of genetic, epigenetic, social, and environmental factors. It is important to note that many preterm spontaneous births are idiopathic. Two thirds of preterm births occur in women without any risk factors. However, there are also some known causes that can contribute to preterm delivery. In general, we can think of these causes as belonging to one of three categories. The first category is maternal factors. Some examples include age, previous history of preterm birth, and medical conditions. In general, expecting mothers under 17 or over 35 are more likely to have preterm deliveries. 
Mothers who have had a preterm delivery in the past, like in our case with Brianka, are also more likely to have a future preterm delivery, usually at the same gestational age. Finally, some medical conditions that are associated with preterm delivery include preeclampsia, hypertension, infections such as UTIs, GBS, and HIV, chronic diseases, nutritional status, use of smoking, and recreational drugs. The second category are placental or uterine factors. These refer to changes or abnormalities of the uterus and placenta that predispose infants to preterm birth. One example is significant intrauterine stretch, which can be caused by multiple gestation, polyhydramnios, or uterine abnormalities such as bicornet uterus, as we saw in our case with Catherine. Another example is intrauterine infection, such as chorioamnionitis, bacterial vaginosis, and premature rupture of membranes. Finally, any intrauterine bleeding, for example due to placental abruption or antepartum hemorrhage, can also lead to preterm delivery. The final category are fetal factors. These refer to congenital or growth-related factors of the fetus themselves that may lead to preterm birth. Congenital causes primarily refer to central nervous system defects, but may also include orofacial or musculoskeletal defects. Another fetal factor may be intrauterine growth restriction. Lastly, fetal distress, which is typically caused by oxygen deprivation of some etiology, can lead to preterm birth. Fetal distress may have spontaneous or iatrogenic causes. So, knowing some of the factors that may contribute to preterm delivery, the Canadian Pediatric Society has some important counseling and management considerations for anticipated extremely preterm birth. First, it is crucial to assess gestational age. Establishing an accurate GA using first trimester crown rump length is crucial for counseling, management, and support of the family as they prepare for their little one. Transferring women at risk for extremely preterm birth to tertiary perinatal centers improves maternal care and provides better opportunities for counseling with MFM specialists and neonatologists. If a transfer is not possible, decisions surrounding management must consider availability of resources and possible limitations of the current setting, as well as use local expertise where possible. Importantly, the use of antenatal corticosteroids has been shown to improve survival rates and decrease the risk of RDS, BP, IVH, and NEC more on those later, in extremely preterm infants. Antenatal corticosteroids are given to women at risk of preterm birth between 22 to 34 weeks GA and have maximal efficacy within seven days of last dose. Additionally, magnesium sulfate is also given between 22 to 34 weeks as it can reduce the risks of cerebral palsy. In terms of delivery, CPS also states that there is currently no evidence that routine C-sections improve neonatal outcomes. Finally, it is crucial that parents facing the birth of an extremely preterm infant should have several opportunities to meet with healthcare providers to create a care plan, which should involve a shared decision-making approach. Let's move on to objective three. Preterm birth can be further classified into four different gestational age ranges, including late preterm, moderate preterm, very preterm, and extreme preterm. Late preterm infants are born between 34 and 37 weeks gestational age. Moderate preterm infants are born between 32 to 34 weeks. Very preterm infants are born between 28 to 32 weeks. And extreme preterm infants are born at a gestational age of less than 28 weeks. Premature infants vary considerably from term infants in size, appearance, and development. For example, while the average birth weight of a term infant is 3,500 grams, a very preterm infant weighs about 1.5 kilograms on average and an extremely preterm infant weighs 0.7 kilograms on average. Other characteristics that vary include skin, genitalia, posture, vision, hearing, breathing, sucking and swallowing, and their sleep and wake cycle. Term infants often have thick skin and appear pale pink. Genitalia are developed and movements are flexed and smooth. Term infants may look at faces and follow curvy lines and may turn their head and eyes to sound. Term infants can cry when hungry and can coordinate breathing and sucking and swallowing. They also typically have defined sleeping and waking states. Very preterm infants may have medium thickness skin. In males, their testes are typically not descended, and in females, the labia minora and clitoris are only partially covered. VPT infants may have some leg flexion and vision and hearing is somewhat limited. These infants may require respiratory support or have apnea and may require nasogastric feeding or TPN. Extremely preterm infants often have thin, gelatinous skin and appear dark red all over their body. In males, their testes are impalpable and their scrotum is smooth. 
In females, the clitoris is prominent and the labia majora are widely separated. Their movements are often extended, jerky, and uncoordinated. Extremely preterm infants may have fused or only partially open eyelids with absent or infrequent movements. They often startle to loud noises. Extremely preterm infants also often require respiratory support and usually require TPN. They do not have a defined sleep cycle and are often in an intermediate sleep state. A useful tool on the wards is the Ballard score. When completing a newborn exam, clinicians can roughly estimate a neonate's gestational age using this tool. The Ballard score is based on the neonate's physical and neuromuscular maturity and is often used within the first 24 hours of life. It is accurate within plus or minus two weeks. So, by now we have been able to define prematurity, evaluate risk factors for preterm birth, and discuss differences between term and preterm infants. In part two, we will be going over major considerations for the initial stabilization of a premature infant, as well as a systems-based approach to recognizing and managing common short-term complications associated with prematurity. Check out www.peedscases.com for more great podcasts, videos, interactive cases, questions, and more. Press subscribe on iTunes to get access to all of our podcasts. If you like what we do, please leave a review on the iTunes store. Share with your friends and colleagues, or think about getting involved.